bird. Potent in existence, you are nature's finest creation. Your image unfavored, yet you wear it as armor. Your path is turbulent, but you navigate with style. A reflection of power, beauty, and resilience. Your gifts allow you to soar heights where angels gather. You taught me how to use my pen to exhale. I still allow it to assist me. An inhaler to the inaudible, painful permanence of your indifference. So, Alex, what do you love most about the Black culture? I would say being fearless with creativity. Dance, art, music, jewelry, poems. But I think the creativity of us is very extensive and sometimes unexplainable to some but beautiful to all. One of my favorite things about black culture is that it's so vast in its expression. Um, you know, you got everybody from, you know, grassroots, earthy type movements all the way up to the executive suite. And all of that encompasses, in my opinion, what black culture can be and the expression of it. Black people are everywhere. And so when I think of black culture in that sense, uh, it just makes me feel makes me feel vast, bro. It makes me feel like, like I can be whatever I feel like being and, uh, and it still be black, 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 black.
I want you to see me, but not for my skin, not from this gift of my kin. I am one, diversified with this melanin. Then open your mouth, tell me what you've been telling them. They haven't reached inside, pulled out the string of lights that you've harvested within. Black culture is just so huge in its influence. And so that makes me feel powerful. It is virtually limitless and it is deeply influential in the way the world works. I feel right now we are encouraging each other um, a lot, but it needs to be continuous. I think, and this is something I've had to break down within my own thoughts. Um, we've been taught a particular way of thinking and we haven't expounded on that. And that's unfortunate in a lot of ways. And so as we see more, we gain more. So I just think that we just need to open ourselves up to see more. You know, we tend to think that being black in America is a limitation. Um, I like to ask the question, what if blackness wasn't a limitation, but a superpower? Because when we look at even American culture and how it's developed over time from its inception, whether you're talking about the indigenous people who were here prior to colonial uh, colonialization or colonization, black people have been siphoned for that power and uh, utilized as a tool, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on who you are, um, for building what we have as American society. Thinking and allowing people to have their own thoughts and not staying within systems that don't allow us to think. We're not thinking for ourselves. We're not changing for ourselves. We're only thinking within the systems. And so once we stop thinking within particular systems, I could elaborate on that though, but once we stop thinking in those systems and just start thinking for ourselves and what life do I want to see out there and I create that life. And that's coming outside of the thoughts of you should, you must, you have to. There's nothing that we should, must, and have to except for what we want to do. We naturally want to connect with each other, but when you know, we have those bouts of, of what we think of as, as violence or um, even laziness. Like, I've, I've, you think about what it means to be black in America, and there's this weird narrative that we're lazy or that there's something like that. So black people just don't trust each other because the same messages that have been um, sort of inundated into our minds over the, the decades um, is how we see ourselves and how we see each other. So first, reckoning with that, and then second, doing whatever it takes to re reframe or revise that story. So when I look at Chu, you know, I see myself rather than seeing somebody that's opposing me. Um, and so creating sustainable unity starts with me being unified with myself. Like to where when I can look in the mirror, I love who I am. Now when I look at my brother, I can love him. Or when I look at my sister, I can love her. And that kind of trust that gets built through learning how to love yourself permeates all your relationships. And so if we can connect with each other in a genuine, authentic way, recognize how we've been conditioned, recognize the traumas that that is, has um, caused, and that we actually take part in perpetuating, um, we can undo the story. And then once the story is undone, it's natural for us to, to connect with each other. And so creating sustainable unity in the black community is just being accepting of yourself first because we've been taught to hate ourselves. of a black man. 
The process of maturity leads a man to one day desire a mate, a light to his darkness, and within that light, there is peace. As fate would have it, one day he finds her, the woman who will teach him how to fly, even though society has clipped his wings. They have each other, they have love, but not just any love, the timeless kind that Miss Roberta Flack harmonized about. She strums his pain with her fingers, he sings her life with his words. She is coming to the touch, and he craves the color of her thoughts. To him, she provides something that nothing else ever could. She provides escape from the world, as well as his own mind. She provides freedom, and she provides a reason for his soul to shout. There's a war going on within his mind as he struggled with everyday stigmas. This man realizes that he has obtained a soulmate. And with his thunderous voice, he pierces her heart with these words. Marry me, won't you? He says, and she replies. Maybe. I already got our whole lives planned out, you know? Our home, our children, <laughs> everything. He appears brave, but on the inside he begs to be loved. So she cradles his mind and nurtures it. You're perfect. You're perfect. <laughs> I love you, black woman. I love your strength. I love your vibe. I love your leadership. I love your wisdom. I love your touch. I love your peace. <laughs> Despite all of this, they are once again reminded of a harsh reality. You know, I worry about you sometimes. I just want you to make it home. Man, I'm tired of this shit! Fuck! Man, fuck this shit! Man, I'm tired of this shit! There's a war going on outside. A community mourns yet another life taken too soon. We are at war with outsiders. We are at war with those meant to protect us. And we are at war with those that we're supposed to call brothers and sisters. So I ask you this. What does a mother tell her children, children of color in order to prepare them for the world? As she hears the news of yet another black man being slain, she hears the news of yet a number of the many fears which slain. remain dormant within have come to a peak. She immediately makes the call, anxious to hear a familiar voice. You see, there is the usual self-doubt that comes along with being a parent. But the narrative derives from a different viewpoint for the black black mother. She wonders if she has done a good enough job with preparing her children to face the world's hate. How are they supposed to deal with routine traffic stops? It's already bad enough that we can't even walk through our own community. Please make it home. The black man has now come to a crossroad. He either succumbs to the pitfalls that dwell within his environment or 
he can rise above and prove that we are all diamonds in the rough. A positive example for his community. A beacon of hope. A beacon of hope. But in order to do so, he must stay the course understanding that it will not be easy. But it is mandatory when creating a positive ripple effect that will live on even after our last breath. So I ask you once more, what does a mother tell her children of color when preparing them for the world? I love you. I appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. There's nothing like you on this earth. You are important. You are divine. You are love. I remember when Kyrie Irving had stood up one time and he basically said, yo, 
I'm tired of being exploited for my talents. Why are we making them money? Let's get together as a collective unit, start our own league. People came out and said, that n crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, did the people, the people really said that though. Remember that? Yeah, so, so the thing is though, they're definitely wrong. You know, Kyrie was 100% right with that. But I can't be mad at, at people for thinking that way because I understand that this is centuries of, of things being instilled in us, basically. You know what I'm saying? You have to understand that when we came over here, everything we knew, our culture was stripped from us and they instilled these thoughts into our head, that slave mentality. And it's still there. It still lingers on. So the thing, what we have to do is retrain, retrain our mind. It's going to take, we have to understand that it's going to take some time because we have, again, centuries of layers to peel back. But our future is dependent on it. We've been, you know, we've been doing this for years and we've had people, we've definitely had people um, fighting, you know, making change, but we have to keep it going. It's gonna take some time. Can we change our way of thinking? That way we can instill things within our youth. So it's important to tell our kids that they're beautiful, they're needed, they're intelligent, their hair is magical, their skin is magical. They are the universe, they are young kings and queens. Our children depend on us. And at the same time, we depend on our children. So these are things that must be done, you know, not for our sake, not for their sake, not even for the sake of black people, for the sake of the entire human race. race. When it comes to corporate America, there are definitely different unwritten rules when it comes to survival. Uh, one of them is code switching. And basically all that is when, when one changes their dialect, you know, in order to fit in or pass. You know, I mean, like for us, like we grew up, growing up, we had our certain, our own dialect. You know, we talked a certain way, we walked a certain way, and that's just us. There's nothing wrong with it. That's just us. But when it comes to corporate America, our dialect can hinder our moving forward. So what we did was we learned to talk a certain way. You know what I'm saying? You know, we learned to talk a certain way in order to, to fit in, to move forward. That's what we had to do. Another thing is the head nod. The head nod is something that's very important to me. If I'm in an environment, I'll walk past 30 people. You know, the first black person I see, you know, I'll give them, you know, a little head nod, maybe throw a little fist in there. Just some acknowledgement, you know, respect. So like basically when you're in a room and bef before you see that there's another man that looks like you, you're kind of like uptight a little bit, right? Yeah. And then when you see somebody like, oh, okay, cool. Right. Like you relax a little bit. You're not all the way relaxed, but it's one more. It's like, okay, cool. Whew. Oh, yeah, I, I, and you probably gravitate to them unknowingly. Maybe you see them in a long, you might leave a scene in between, but like, oh, what's up, brother? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It <laughs> can be a stranger. Stranger, you ain't gotta know his name, but he's your brother, though. The head nod is universal. Shoot, I know I've gotten to the point where I actually get mad if I give you that head nod and you don't acknowledge my head nod. <laughs> the head nod. 
a crucial form of communication for the black man in America. Especially when outnumbered, it is important to check in with your fellow man, a common ground for both familiar faces as well as strangers. It is considered disrespectful if you do not abide by this rule. Without saying anything, a head nod says everything. The upward nod. What's up? You good? I am here with you. I am here for you. It also means I'm good. I'm safe and you are not alone, brother. Stay strong. The downward nod. Often used when crossing paths with women or older gents. It has the same impact as the upward nod but with an added amount of respect. Revolution wasn't televised in the 60s. Uh, is it going to be televised in the 90s? Well, you know, the, the, the catchphrase, what that was all about, uh, the revolution will not be televised, that was about the fact that the first change that takes place is in your mind. You have to change your mind before you change the way you live and the, and the way you move. So when we said that the revolution will not be televised, we were saying that, like, that, that, that the thing that's going to change people it's something that no one will ever be able to capture on film. It'll just be something that you see and all of a sudden you realize, I'm on the wrong page. And welcome to the revolution. person next to you. It means creating your own thoughts. And they may not be original to someone else, but they will be original to you. So I just encourage everyone to think your own thoughts. Allow people to be themselves. Do not correct people. Allow people the chance to change and to evolve. We're all here for our own purposes, not for anyone else, but for yourself. Trust yourself. Believe in yourself. Love yourself first. You are the first and most important person to you. Love you. An artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. I think that is true of, of, of painters, sculptors, poets, musicians. I, it's because I'm concerned it's their choice. But I choose to reflect the times and the situations in which I find myself. That to me is my duty. I, and, and, and at this crucial time in our lives, when everything is so desperate, when every day is a matter of survival, I don't think you can help but be involved. Young people, black and white, know this. That's why they're so involved in politics. We will shape and mold this country or it will not be molded and shaped at all anymore. So I don't think you have a choice. How can you be an artist and not reflect the times? That to me is the definition of an artist. I never intend for my children to look at me and be ashamed and say, Mama, why didn't you do something? I will have done mine.
this one, I'm just playing around with. So say if I want to throw some hi hats on it, because I got an idea where I want to go with it a little bit. Ever since I came to D with the idea, it was just instant vibing. It was this perfect setup because if I hear the music, I can see what I want to do, which direction I want to go with editing or filming. And if I show him a picture, uh, a video clip, tell him my ideas, he can actually hear the music. The next thing we needed to do is just go out and grab the talent. This is what's going to capture everybody mm -hmm. and be like, damn, I love, you know, being black and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and then, but then we're going to take that, that turn. It's going to be a dramatic turn because it's actually going to be this love scene with you and your wife. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to, I'm going to do it because I, I got to handle how it's going to transition. But I got it to where it takes this dramatic turn. And that's when we go into our struggles and everything we deal with on this day. Uh, we're going to highlight some stuff, some very uncomfortable stuff. Mm -hmm. That's when you, that's when your performance is going to be also, mm -hmm. or one of them. Um, but then after that, we're going to turn again. And it's going to be like straight, uh, uh, straight, just hammering some black pride. Eyes and mistakes, live sell the stake for the rise to be great. Devil's pie on your face, sparking knife on the play. Your choice of poison got you voicing up your cries to the gates like Lord. I remember Craig told me one time, everyone on your team has to be as good as you, if not better than you, at their respective craft. Each um scene is gonna be pretty different, you know, so mm -hmm. you can kind of use your own artistic flair. You know what I'm saying? So I always trusted them with whatever they wanted to do because I wanted to get that full potential. And the only way to do that is if I let them be themselves, you know. Sometimes it's hard to sing. Something like that. Okay. That's it. And we just, we just came together. We just came together and we created magic. Everyone on the team, everyone a part of this. It requires something special in order to be able to pull something off like this. You know, people don't just wake up every day. People don't just wake up every day and say, I want to create a musical. So yeah, I was just I was just really blessed to have the people around me that I did, you know, the pieces. Everyone was a piece to the bigger picture, basically. So the time comes to get licensing for the actual Blackbird song. You know, it's a Beatles song, so based on the caliber of the artist, they want to see uh, what I'm doing with it. They want to see the visual. They want to hear it. They want to uh, everything, basically. So it was a gamble already. There's a huge chance that they're going to say no. But if you do get it, it's going to be very expensive also. All the paperwork is done and everything. Finally got the call. They turned it down. So now I feel, I feel like I let my team down, you know, because... We did all this filming, all this recording of the music, and and now it's like for nothing. You know, the song is called Ballad of the Black Bird. We don't even have the Black Bird song. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I, I did cry. You know, I was down, I felt defeated. Thankfully, I had Perp there. She gave me some words of affirmation, just like any great partner would do, you know? And she got me out of that slump. I saw the bigger picture, everything happens for a reason. So I got off the phone with her, Call up D. Yo, this is what we're going to do. We're going to drop the lyrics, keep that, add some violins, blah, blah, blah. Perp is going to add our own spoken word. We're back on it. You know, an hour later, that's when that leadership comes into play. How can you come back from defeat? How can you stand up to that adversity? So surely, sure enough, everything worked out how it was supposed to work out. So with all that being said, I really just want to say thank you to everyone who came out tonight for the premiere of Ballad of the Blackbird, whether it's to support me, uh, to support a family member, a friend. It's all the same love. This is all of our project, you know, everyone who is involved uh, on the camera or off the camera. This is all of our project. So it's a special night for all of us. You know, thank you to my team. Once again, everyone. Couldn't, obviously, I couldn't have done it without you. Um, I'm going to stop rambling, you know, but again, thank you all and I hope you enjoy the film.